The Clash of Triton was a game released by Chewy Software based on the Spongebob episode of the same name. We checked it out in our last video, and to say the least, I wasn't too impressed by it. The controls were weird and unresponsive, some of the humor felt really strange, and the whole premise just seemed bizarre. You took control of the giant muscular Spongebob and Patrick, who went around smashing buildings so new ones could rise and take their place. It had next to nothing to do with the episode that inspired it, and seemed like a wild adaptation to make based on it. A few people pointed out that the game bore a striking resemblance to an old arcade game called Rampage. I had actually played this game before, and I thought about it while making my last review, but it was so long ago, and I figured the games wouldn't be similar enough to make mention of it. Not to mention, I couldn't even remember the name of it. So I took the liberty of checking out Rampage, and yeah, I can see where some of the inspiration came from. But with this in mind, it only makes The Clash of Triton even more bizarre. They really watched the episode and went, hmm, I'm really feeling Rampage from this. But enough about that. This Spongebob special was a big enough deal to get two sizable adaptations on Nick.com. Both seem to be equally popular among fans and are often confused for one another. The Flash game version was developed by Workin' Man, a company that made a good few Spongebob Flash games. I know, I was also shocked to learn it wasn't just one Workin' Man. Supposedly, this game has more in common with the PC version of The Clash of Triton than the episode itself. This time, it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up in the style of games like Final Fight or Streets of Rage, so let's check it out for ourselves. At the very beginning, we're brought to the scene from the episode where Spongebob releases Triton from confinement. For some reason, this is the one time in the game where you have a choice between two different options. You can choose to either release him or leave him in the cage. I've got a life to live. I can't be stuck in this cage, man. This is bogus. So, what's the point of even having the option? If the game won't even start until you say yes, it's really just there for a few extra lines of dialogue. Not really necessary. So once you say yes, we're treated to a crispy scene from the episode itself. Triton destroys everything, and then we enter the Bikini Bottom stage. King Neptune doesn't really seem to care that you're the one responsible for this, and he bestows superpowers on you so you can save the city from his son and the idiots who decided to become loyal to him. Seriously, he's trying to destroy you. Why are you working for him? This says a lot about our society. SpongeBob takes on his design from the Neptune Spatula episode, which makes for a nice callback. The game is similar to the other Clash of Triton game in that you have to fight through the city with superpowers, but it's completely different in terms of style. It's a Final Fight-inspired beat-em-up where you fight Triton's minions and walk through a screen that moves to the side once all the on-screen enemies are cleared. Right off the bat, I gotta say this is more what I expected from a Clash of Triton game than what the PC version gave us. You actually go out to fight Triton and his minions rather than smash buildings for some reason. At first, you just smash the spacebar to defeat enemies with your magic spatula. You even have soldiers in spongy armor that fight with you. Also, the music really sets the mood. <laughs> When enemies die, they drop hero coins that despawn after a few seconds. Collecting a certain amount will increase your hero points and supposedly make you stronger, but I never really noticed a difference in my strength as I leveled up. They also drop extra health every so often. The first stage is really easy, but the difficulty rockets when the first boss appears. That's right, it's the first stage and we're already facing Triton. Surprising, but I don't entirely dislike this decision. It works to set you up for a future rematch. Not to mention, Triton's name is literally in the title. It doesn't hurt to have him in the game a little more. So I struggled with fighting him the first time because it's really hard to hit him when he's in the air. He shoots these... globs of goo or something at you and they can easily pummel you. It's hard to estimate their trajectory because they can hit you if only a tiny pixel touches Spongebob. He sends them in sequence and your recovery time isn't very long, so it's easy for another to hit you right after the first one does. Yes, I know they're supposed to be green lasers, but they look like globs of goo. So once you beat him, he swears revenge and calls you Spongeboob. Considering your design, that's a very appropriate nickname. You're given a relic for completing the stage, which gives you a new ability. Then you're brought to a menu where you can select a stage or solve this puzzle. Why is Patrick looking at me like that? What's going on in his mind? If you click on him, he solves the puzzle for you, so... thanks, I guess. You get a relic for completing it. 
or having Patrick complete it for you. The next stage is Sandy's Tree Dome, where the enemies are slightly different. The music is awesome here. <laughs> I also like the design choice of having these gravestone things in the background. Are those the victims from Spongebob's Whirlybird incident? Way to make Sandy's tree dome terrifying. They even killed her tree! These Grim Reaper guys are kinda eerie too. I also really like how creative they get with the weapons the enemies carry. These big guys carry pufferfish on a stick. Is one of those Mr. Puff? These other guys carry seahorses and swordfish. Imagine being beaten to death with a seahorse. Of course, there's the morbid fact that they're using their fellow sea creatures as weapons, but Sublime Seafoods exists and they literally eat fish there, so I can't imagine the Spongebob fish respect each other very much. Sandy is the boss of this stage and she's mutated into a Cerberus monster. This is really cool because remember, Neptune and Triton are inspired by Greek and Roman mythology. I love that they're actually taking advantage of that fact and getting creative with it. Now let's talk about the special moves. Once you use them, they need a short break to regenerate, but it isn't too long, so you don't have to worry about wasting them. So far, you can shoot three different blasts from this Greek column jellyfish cannon. Never thought I'd say those things together. Even though it fires in three directions, it isn't the strongest of your weapons, and it takes a moment to fire. If you get hit before you can activate a special move, the move is cancelled, but you still have to wait for it to regenerate. The other weapon you have is a trident you can throw like a spear. It requires precision since your targets will often be moving. Remember this one for later. The special moves really help out, but I'll admit it's a little awkward having to press the numbers on your keyboard to select them. Since space is attack and Z is jump and the arrow keys move you, hitting the numbers takes a little more brain work, and it's easy to hit the wrong one on the fly. You know what this means. You'd better go out and buy Spongebob Teaches Typing so you can learn proper keyboard etiquette. After winning this wild and exciting game, you can hit every button on your keyboard at lightning speed without any trouble. Order Spongebob Teaches Typing today, only $19.99 plus shipping and handling. Keyboard sold separately. And no, it's not called Spongebob Squarepants Typing, you've been lied to. So as a boss, Sandy is really challenging because she stomps the ground and kicks up rows of painful dust at you. It's hard to dodge them because they take up most of the screen and they rise fairly high so it's hard to jump over them. Once you can get to her, she takes a lot of damage from a single strike so it's easy to drain her health bar from there. Then she turns back to normal. I love how Spongebob feels the need to say, I saved you. Like, yeah, thanks, I didn't notice. Next up is Goo Lagoon, where people attack you with eels. At least there are no unexpected buildings here this time. Your newest relic is a conch you can blow into to summon soldiers to fight with you like in the first stage. It's oddly useful in the later levels. Squidward is the boss here, and I believe his design is inspired by Typhon. Again, I really appreciate that. I can't stress enough how happy I am to see them embracing the cultural aspects of King Neptune. Squidward rains bubbles of death on you, but you have to wait until he attempts to squash you with a tentacle. Then you attack the tentacle. The bubbles fall everywhere, so it's really hard to avoid them. Still, not too bad. Just challenging enough. Jellyfish Fields is next. I don't know what those green plants in the background are supposed to be, but I like the design here. The music is also ominous and foreboding. Makes you feel like something really bad is about to happen. Your newest ability is a shield, which I rarely use intentionally. Always when I accidentally hit the 3 button instead of 2 or 4. Looks like I need to freshen up my typing skills with Spongebob Teaches Ty- Okay, enough of that. These big enemies with hammerhead sharks act as mini-bosses, and they're kinda cool. Super easy, though. I've gotten really good at mashing buttons from all the Nick Arcade games I've played. You then meet Patrick, who's turned into a satyr. I love that even though he's a mutated monster, he still has his usual personality and only acts mean because he's supposed to. He's really easy, he just charges at you with normal enemies backing him up and you just hit him when he has an opening. Then he makes that face again. The next stage is Bikini Bottom all over again. At first, I thought I clicked on the wrong level, but even Spongebob acknowledges how strange it is to be back in the opening cutscene. Your newest weapon is Thor's hammer, I mean Neptune's storm hammer, and it delivers a super powerful blow whenever it's used. It's easy to predict that Mr. Krabs will be the next boss fight too. Kind of a shame they reused an earlier stage for no big reason, but at least the music is still good. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mr. Krabs is now a giant scorpion, and again, you just wait till you have an opening and strike until he turns back to normal. Now we're on to the final stage, Neptune Valley, and boy is it something. Check out that semi-realistic background. You fight the usual onslaught of enemies until you reach Triton once again. Now here's where the real fun begins. Triton has the same moves as he did the first time, along with enemies fighting with him, but he also has this seemingly impenetrable barrier around him. He also has this move where he launches a giant green beam into the ground and it's extremely hard to avoid. Like with the Goo Balls, it has a ridiculous hit range, don't even let a fraction of a pixel on Spongebob touch it. It also sucks that whenever you reach a boss, your health doesn't recover. Health drops are rare, and you need every bit of it to win this fight. I gotta admit, I almost reached the point where I was about to give up. My attacks were not landing for whatever reason. I was seriously beginning to wonder if my game was bugged because not even his shield was taking damage from any attack. That was when I learned you can throw your trident at him at just the right angle to take down his shield. Then you can finally attack him. Yeah, thanks, that was real obvious. They couldn't have included a hint somewhere that said only a strike from the Spear of Neptune can fall the Great Triton or something like that. That would have been really clever and I'd gladly commend them for it. I wouldn't mind having to strategize to win a fight, but the way the game is set up doesn't comfortably allow for trial and error. You have to do the entire stage all over again if you die, so it quickly becomes long and frustrating to figure out. But I will admit, it's satisfying when you win. Now let's watch the final cutscene. Or not. For some reason, it just doesn't want to load. It's just another clip from the episode, so we aren't missing too much, but it's oddly hilarious that this would happen after that intense boss fight. You don't even get an ending for that. So as a reward for beating the game, you get to play again on a harder difficulty. Hooray! And that brings us to the end of the other Clash of Triton game. So what do we think about this one? Eh, it's an improvement. Nothing groundbreaking, but oddly amusing to play through. I'll even admit I was having a bit of fun with it at times. Again, this is what a Clash of Triton game should be. It fits the story far more than Smashing Buildings Rampage style. It also lends itself to using different elements from mythology, and I really appreciate that. The music is good, the gameplay is interesting, and overall, it's a fine adaptation. It was a simple Flash game, and not a big, highly marketed release, so we can't expect AAA quality, but I think I got mostly what I expected from it. I would have preferred for the controls to be a little closer together and for the final boss to be easier to figure out, but I can't say it's a terrible game. A fine adaptation to one of the most forgettable Spongebob specials. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go practice my typing skills in Spongebob Teaches Typing. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.